All right, YouTube. Hey, thanks for joining us again here at the First Attachment channel. Excited. Another another great guest tonight. Daniel DeBrock is joining us. Uh, Daniel is a chief content creator for Stack Strength, Elite FTS, Kabuchi Strength, Breaking Muscle, and T Nation. Was recently featured on Dave Tate's Table Talks as well. Really excited to have him. And of course, as always, my co-host, Mr. Justin Harris. So as we jump into the content today, just a friendly reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. And as always, put comments in the comment section. This, this uh, Our channel, as you know, is educationally based. So we do want your comments and questions, and our team will get back to you with those answers. So now that that's out of the way, Daniel, welcome to the welcome to the show. Happy to have you on. Yeah, man. It's, it's great to be here. I really appreciate the invites, and uh, I'm looking forward to the chat. Yeah, good deal. I think it was interesting. So we'll kind of catch our guest up to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago. And then, of course, we want to unpack your history. But I think we'll maybe only go back to like right before COVID history. Then we'll 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 have to you know go further a little bit later. But um, we were just all chatting about how Justin actually right around before COVID was on uh, your podcast, right? And so if you could tell just our viewers out there, I'm sure you know they can. As I mentioned, you're you're just recently featured on Table Talks. We can talk a little bit about your podcast and what you like to cover with your educational content? Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of been evolving a little bit since I started because I started the podcast during COVID and cause I was like, I don't really have anything to do, <laughs> you know? And I just kind of wanted to have more conversations. I honestly just thought it was a great opportunity for me to learn and interview people who I thought were way smarter than me yeah. and a lot more experience. And so that's basically what I did. And, uh, so I, I was really lucky actually, cause I've got a very solid, uh, guest roster on on my on my podcast and so um that was kind of how things came out and then like i you know like we mentioned earlier i had justin on we were talking all about nutrition for bodybuilding and stuff like that and that was that was really interesting because again you get all these different perspectives around what works and and why something works or why something doesn't work and there's a lot of there's just a lot of different perspectives out there based on people's experience so yeah, no, and I, tr I trust me, I was just digging through your content. There's so much great stuff out there. So definitely for our viewers, be sure to check it out. But I uh, selfishly made a list a list of questions to unpack that we'll hopefully get to. But, uh, you know, uh, first, I guess we'll kind of maybe take a minute and just, you know, talk a little bit about, because you the correct, you were uh, originally a, a fighter, right? Or is it uh, your boxing originally? Or? Yeah, yeah. A long time ago, I was, uh, I started out in jiu-jitsu and then. Okay competed in that for a while and I, I was decent at it, but like, I really just like striking. And so then once I started, uh, once I started striking, that was just sort of it for me, the club closed down. So I ended up just kind of specializing in Muay Thai and boxing. So I fought that for, I don't know how many years, eight years or something like that. Yeah. And then it, it seems like that kind of evolved as I was going through some of your content, like evolved into a passion for, coaching athletes and kind of strength sports a little bit more? Yeah. So it was actually really arbitrary. A lot of, <laughs> I don't know if it's been your experience, but my experience has been a lot of coaches who got into the field just did so kind of on a whim. So mm -hmm. I, when I decided to stop fighting, there was just this massive gap in my life because I would train for three hours in the morning, go to work, train for three hours at night. And I did that seven days a week. And that's not an exaggeration. Like that's how long, how much I trained. And so then when I was done, I was just like, what do I, like, I just go home from work and I would just literally sit there and wait for the next day. I'm like, I don't know what to do with my life. So, um, I was still coaching a little bit of boxing at the time. And one of the guys I was coaching was like a two time Olympian, uh, bobsleigh athlete in, in Canada. And so he was just a freak athlete, super jacked, insanely strong and explosive and just like really, really impressive. So I was like, what do you do? He's like, oh, I do Olympic weightlifting, bobsleigh and all stuff. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll try training like that. So I started doing Olympic weightlifting at this facility. And then one of the guys found out about my athletic background and asked if I wanted to be a coach. And uh, I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And so sure. uh, went and did my little diploma thing. And then he hired me on. And that was 11 years ago, a little more, something like that. So, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's really cool because it's like, you know, like you said, you're fighting and just – yeah, I'll give it a shot. And then now you're, you know, a, 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 an authoritative uh, figure in the field, writing so much great content out there to help people with their, you know, their training program. So, um, Justin, just want to give you a chance to anything to kind of add to 
those experiences and what you've seen as far as people coming up in the industry or? Well, I mean, I think now it's, it, it's weird in that a lot of people want, it, it used to like, it's, it's, it's funny how far it's evolved. Cause when I first started doing it, you know, well, no one was doing it. I mean, I think we even made a joke at table talk. Like I, I had a couple of times doing like Polaroids. Cause Polaroids, yeah. yeah, it was like, like 2002, three. I mean, you like, you couldn't really even do send video. You could send pictures, but even that was like really hard, you know? Uh, and so it was, you could send like really low res images, but, uh, and so like, you, it wasn't like a thing. It's not like you could brag about it as a job and no one really, no one thought of it as a, as a job like that you could make a career out of. Uh, yeah. But uh, what I've kind of found is it, it almost has to be that way. Cause it's, it's so much different. You know, like it almost has to be where you stumble onto it. Cause it's so much different than anything else. You can't come at it with like a business plan because it doesn't work that way. It's not like throw a bunch, you know, like a, a smart business model. If you have enough in, money invested into it, you know, you can, you can kind of, pay for the growth, you know, proper marketing, proper advertising. You can't do that because your, 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 ad, your growth comes from your clients and that takes time. You know, at the very least, you got to work with someone several months to make an appreciable change in their physique with them that now you have something to advertise. And yeah. so it's, it's like a weird thing that you, you, it's not like you can't liver King it, you know, like liver King's thing was, you know, get a ton of money, have a, have a, a plan, create this character and then just get a brilliant marketing team to you know to, to go everywhere well lever king lasted what like that whole thing was like nine months you know he, he wouldn't even as a coach you know he wouldn't even have a handful of clients to show before and afters for in that period where that whole that whole business basically rose and fell in that time where this is at uh because like i just hired a new nutritionist a new uh, coach actually it'll be a, like a, a program he's a strength and conditioning coach so he won't be doing as much nutrition he'll be programming uh his name's greg uh uh, we interviewed him. He was a yeah. strength and conditioning coach at Iowa State. I just hired him at Troponin Nutrition. And, you know, he's all excited. And I, I'm about to send him an email like, ah, well, don't be excited because I, the truth is, you know, like you have to be willing to do this hard, long and hard and make no money on it for way longer than any sane person would be willing to do it. And, and then it snowballs. And then all of a sudden it's a career. You know, and then everyone's like, oh, that's awesome. You get to work from home. It's like, well, now, but it was like two years where I, all I did was work. I made no money, you know. Well, I remember, uh, than that. I remember you were talking on the, like the Fuad podcast a couple of years ago and you were saying how you work on your business, you know, eight or 10 hours a day, just like if you were working there. And I remember asking, I said, well, Justin, were you promoting yourself? What are you doing? He's like, no, I was just so focused on my clients so I could get referrals from them and, yeah. you know, do yeah. such a great job. I mean, so with kind of that context, like Daniel, what has your experience been like as you've transitioned into coaching, you know, is it kind of a similar approach to what we're talking about here? And how did you, how did you grow to where you are today? Oh man. Um, I'm probably the worst when it comes to <laughs> marketing and stuff. Uh, what, what I will say is I've noticed that, the more that I am just kind of honest, like online, like the, the more that my online presence actually reflects who I am as an individual, the more engagement that I get. Yeah. You know, so like I made a post not too long ago where I was like, um, and I talked about this in the table talk one as well, where I said something like, you know, be skeptical of advice coming from fat nutritionist, uh, weak strength coaches, uh, skinny bodybuilding coaches or, and, and researchers with like no athletic, so, something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, but I didn't say overweight. I said fat because people's sensitivity to the word fat is fucking ridiculous. And mm -hmm. around here. Sure. Um, <laughs> and so like, you know, I, I will take certain stances and, um, I think everyone kind of has a unique perspective on things. You know, if you've been doing it long enough, you, you, you work with certain people, you have different experiences that sort of mold how you see the world. And so I think that there is a demographic that will resonate with that and that will connect with that. And, you know, there are people like The Rock who essentially have a massive brand and their whole MO is just be good and don't piss anyone off. But that's not a real person, in my mm. opinion, you know? And that's fine. Like he's all like he's crazy successful. So it's like obviously it's working. But I mean, I guess for me, the one thing that I've noticed is the more that I just um, 
I guess I'm honest about like my perspective on things and I don't sugarcoat it and I don't avoid maybe speaking about difficult subjects or controversies and things like that. Uh, I think that there's kind of a place for that. And so I think that you'll attract people who will want to work with you. And if they want to work with you, they're probably going to get better results with you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And outside of that, I also think that you kind of have to be really diligent with, with your prospecting because like there's so many coaches out there who suck, but they're great at marketing. Just their, their funnel and their transitions and how they do yeah, everything. Yeah, like probably the majority. Off I mean, the boxes. And they basically end up being professional friends, you know, where it's like, oh, but I, I like this guy. He supports me. And it's like, that's great. You know, and I'm not here to tell someone how to spend their money. Right. But at the end of the day, if you're a coach, you need to get results, you know, so. I think people, you, you know, you can't there's a reason being an actor is difficult or there's only, you know, so many movie stars. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's difficult to fake authenticity. It really is, you know? And so, yeah. like you said, just when you are yourself, I mean, people see that, you know, cause that that's difficult to fake. Or, and you can, you can be a good marketer and you can be, you know, a good salesman and sell yourself, but you're not getting, those, those are first time clients. Those are not return clients, you know? And so right. what you're doing at that point is it's a never ending windmill of, get a client and he stays on for a month or two get a new client stays on for a month or two and so you you're you know i have I, like my oldest client i have a client two, since 2005 continuously hmm. uh yeah and so her 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 price is reflects that cuz uh, cuz uh i i like at one point i told her you know like uh, you know you've been you've been with me you've been with me so long this was probably 2007 <laughs> i said you know i'll just keep you at the same price i'm raising my prices but i'll keep you but every time that comes through i'm reminded like yeah geez you know like and you don't you don't get that unless you're you know like you are yourself with them if you're a salesman you'll get clients new clients you know if you're a good coach you'll keep clients yeah that's a really great point and that's that's a difficult thing. So that took me a long time because I'm, I've never really been a, a very social person. <laughs> so, you know, I was always very data driven. I'd always be looking at that stuff and I'd get people really good results. But I know that initially I didn't have referrals. Like that was not a big, I'd get people great results. They'd get the results and then they just bounce. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> and then I remember having a chat with someone and they're like, dude, you fucking suck. Like you don't, you don't ever talk to them. Like you're always just about the result, and you never actually treat them like a human being. And this was like, maybe like one or two years into when I started being like an in-person personal trainer. And I was like, Oh shit. You know? And so, I mean, it's taken me like eight years to (laughs) to really actually become decent at it. And so it's, it's a really tough skill to, to actually adopt a client centric focus. Like it, it, at least for me, it is anyways. No, I I agree. I'm I'm similar. I'm not outgoing. And so my early on, you know, and I think like Joe even told me like, at one point he said something that kind of reminded me of this like my early online persona was much more curt like i treat it like an engineer you know like um you're you know i i need to i need to change these things about you here's how we'll change them and you realize that you're you're not working with robots and i say that all the time you know like what's the best diet it's like well you know like or the best training plan or what it's you know like it's it's more than that because you're not working with a robot you know you're working with a human and you have to consider those things and like once you realize that and consider those things it, it makes you a better coach because then uh, you, you know, you you realize this whole gamut of what you're playing with, you know, like, is this person going through a divorce? You know, like they, they have a young child at home or, you know, and you, you, you can be stubborn and you can treat it like an engineer and say like, here's the best approach, do it or don't, do it or don't, I don't care, you know, or you can say like, Hey dude, dude, you know, I know you got the six month old at home. Uh, we got this meet on this day, you know, we got a peak for that. And so we have to figure a way we can manage these next six months to get you to meet prep at 10 weeks out in as best shape as possible. Cause if, if we try to go all out these next six months, when you're not getting any sleep, we're going to run, we're going to be dead when we start meet prep, you know, like just, you know, like it's, I mean, it's obvious when you think about it, you know, but it, it really wasn't for me at the start because I was just treating them like, you know, like, well, the textbook says this, so this is what we needed, you know, like, cause you know, like it, it's very easy to put out the best, uh, the best diet or best training program. If you were writing it for a robot, who is always going to have high the same amount of energy entering the gym every time who is going to you know had no feelings who has nothing else in their life that's an easy program to write you know that's like just take you know every ev- everything you know about programming and put it into the perfect program boom that's easy but you're not writing them for for robots 
Yeah. And it's, I think you touched on something that's super, super important as well, because I mean, there have been several times where I've had an athlete actually. So just recently I had an athlete who reached out uh, during their check-in and they were like, Hey, you know, this last week was a wash. Like I was just so tired and stressed out, da, da, da. you know, I was crappy on this crappy on that. And, you know, like, I just, I need to take some extreme ownership here. And they're just like, there's a lot of judgment there. So I just like during, cause I, I do video calls, right? I think it's really important for them to actually see your face, hear your voice and watch you review the things because then it actually shows you actually are doing that in the first place. But um, I remember just saying like, dude, relax. Like you, you were one of the most disciplined clients that I have had ever period. You missed a week. And it was a shitty week and you had like three hours sleep on some of these nights. You're fine. Like I'm not stressing, you know, when I'm looking at this stuff, I'm looking at trends and you've historically been incredibly disciplined. I don't think that this blip is really something that's indicative of your, your typical behavior. And so sort of acknowledging them and giving them like a break when they need to, or like you were saying, Hey, you know, you have this contest prep coming up right now because your kid, you know, your sleep is all messed up and your kid's awake or whatever, or they're going through a divorce. It's sort of acknowledging and validating the person with where they're at. And they're like, Oh shit. One, he's actually paying attention Two, he's actually treating me like a human being. And you're probably going to need a lot more buy-in and a lot more respect and loyalty in the long term as well, because let's say they they want to do something and you're like, ah, it's probably not a good idea. If you just tell them no, then, you know, they might listen to you, but part of them is going to be a little bit resentful. Whereas if you're like, mm-hmm. okay, you know, we can do that. Here's my concern with that. But yeah. We still can. And then you let them and you let them fail. But then because you let them fail and because you predicted uh, what was going to happen now, they're like, oh, not only does he know what he's doing, but he's actually including me in the process. So it's a collaborative mm-hmm. approach. And like that level of buy-in in my experience is just, it, it's so important in terms of like the long-term results that, that you're going to get because they'll just, they'll do fucking anything for you. At right. that point. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I'm not, uh, not, not cut you off because that ties in a little bit what you said earlier about like the people who are good at marketing and stuff is, is what you said, like you, they won't, they, they need to understand, they know who you are and to want to work with you. And people don't realize how key that is because like someone will try to, so, you know, like, one of my clients would be like, oh, my buddy's so out of shape. I need to get him in shape. I'm going to refer him to you. And it's like, you know, th- that's great, but he doesn't know who I am. You know, right. not that I'm like, not I'm something special, but he doesn't, he, he doesn't, my, at, at this point in his life, he, at, Justin Harris is no different than Don Billingsworth or some random guy. And so he doesn't know if what I'm saying is better than what the guy, the random trainer at his gym says, what the guy who's in a CrossFit at his work says. So there's no, you know, it doesn't hold additional value, you know, and that's very important. That's why I think like that people are good at advertising. They never get that. You know, anybody who comes to me has been, has followed me. They've seen me through some organic thing, or they've been referred by someone who's, who's seen, who's had progress with me, but it's all like, and <clears throat> Like what, to tie back in what you were just saying, like when they re, they have that I don't know the word, but they 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 know you and they they have this backlog of of understanding your now your your knowledge. They're gonna appreciate the things you say more. Where someone who doesn't, you know, you know, because you know you can imagine like go, I can go to some sport like like pool, you know, and I go to some pool hall and some guy named Efren Reyes is there shooting pool, and my buddy's like, oh, you should learn from him. You know, and a guy named Efren Reyes is like the greatest pool player of all time. But if you don't know that, it doesn't mean anything. And some guy named Steve that pit tool next to you tells you, you know, something different than Efren tells you. You don't know. You don't know which is right. You know, neither because you don't. Neither don't mean anything to you. And that's that's really important. And then building that with your own clients, so that the the people that are around them they hear that about you. That's where you really kind of like earn your trust as a coach. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and I was going to mention, uh, you know, the difference between online coaching and in person. Um, and I also think, as you were talking, you know, I think about over time, how much, uh, you know, more in tune I try to get with my client. So like one of my questions right now, recently with a client who's training specifically for powerlifting, but we're trying to adjust some weight, um, drop some body fat and still keep performance, you know, going in the right direction where we time the her lower days but she trains at 4 30 in the morning 
And so I was just talking about like where we put them in the, I would have never had that conversation, but I'm talking more about how do you feel this day? How do you feel that day? Like, how do you feel going to the gym? Like outside of how you feel when you're actually working out and it just kind of has helped that discussion because when we first started, Justin and I, in the early two thousands, we were joking about it that now even Justin's diets have evolved uh, probably years ago, but, um, we would be training legs on like a low, you know, after three low days in a row, we're just completely blown out to where it was like now just kind of mapping the nutrition, even with the training, but then understanding their lifestyle, like, okay, she works these hours. And then these days she's working 14 hour shifts. And these days we're going to just kind of getting to know the, you know, yeah, it's one to know the schedule, but also how the person adapts to the schedule to where to me, you tell me train at four 30 in the morning. I'm like, Oh my gosh, like that'd be brutal. Cause I have a hard time falling asleep at night. So like I would respond totally different than, the client, but I think having that discussion, uh, just, just, you know, really helps to kind of unpack that as you go forward. Yeah. hundred percent. And I mean, it's one of those things where, so I've got a fairly big family. I've got seven siblings <laughs> and there are times where like you hear someone come yeah, in and based on how they open and shut the door, you know who it is like based on that sound. Mm -hmm. It's if I had to describe that to someone else, and they're like, how do you know it's this person instead of this person? I'm like, I don't fucking know. Like how, I, I have no idea, but intuitively I know because I have such an intimate knowledge of this individual. And I think that the more time you spend with clients and the more that you talk about their lives outside and like what's going on, and you don't need to know all these personal details necessarily, but when they start telling you about, oh, you know, we're launching this new app. Oh, cool. What's the app about? Oh, okay, cool. You know, and you know, they're launching an app now. Um, you know that they're going to back and forth between, exactly right. You know they're going back and forth between two houses in in different uh, suburbs or something like that. Oh, okay. Well, I know that they have some travel demands, and then just over time you start accumulating this knowledge. You start understanding like, oh, this person's more complex than just an engineer. Mm -hmm. They're 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 a father. They're you know uh, a, an entrepreneur. They're an engineer. They they have like all these different things. They're powerlifters. They're enthusiasts. They're so you start getting this really big picture. And so anytime you hear a piece of information as well, the amount of information that it actually conveys just from a single data point is actually much more uh, deep. It's much richer because you actually have a lot more context to where that piece fits in. And so if someone says, you know, hey, I've got a busy week coming up. Well, now I know that this is actually like incredibly busy because this person never complains about being busy and they work long. Mm. So I know that it's not just like, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just a little bit busy. Like I know we really have to scale back their, their training and we need to maybe up their nutrition or something like that. So I think you only really get that by having those extended conversations over, you know, months and years of working with someone, but it really does make a big difference because at some point, you can't really optimize your diet that much more beyond a certain point. Like once people are checking the boxes, you know, like what are you, you're going to switch your nutrient timing from like two to two fifteen. Like, I don't know how much you're going to get out of that. You know, sure. You have to start looking at some of those other variables, like the lifestyle variables, the stress, the mood, are they feeling fulfilled in their lives and, and things like that, which I know sound a little bit airy fairy at times, but I think it'd be incredibly impactful. Yeah, I was going to, um, uh, with, with that, you know, just kind of, especially for the audience out there, you know, if you could walk through a little bit more about your, what is your typical client like? And is it a mixture of in-person and online or, or how does that kind of work out for you? Because I, I, there's somewhere I want to go with some of that. I, I was looking at a lot of your content that I think would be really, really good as we kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, so I don't do any in-person coaching anymore which kind of works well for me because I'm pretty introverted. <laughs> so if I, like when I used to have a lot of sessions, I would just be exhausted by the end of it because you just have to be on all the time. That's what, so, what's funny. Is that's what they say. They say, uh, you know, extra like introverts get, you know, that never enjoy. like that because I'm introverted too. And so like if I go to a wedding, even if I have a good time, I'm ex I mean, I'm, I'm wrecked after I'm exhausted. Even if I go to a, just even like a big conference, I'm so completely drained after where extroverts yeah. are the opposite. They get energized by those situations, you know, and it's like understanding about that, that about yourself, I think is really important because it's, uh, for years, I kind of fought that thinking like, you know, like, you know, something's wrong, you know, like I shouldn't, you know, this is incorrect. And before, you know, finally accepting that, you know, this is the way I am. If I'm in a, in a big event like that, I'm, I'm not coming out of it energized. I'm going out of it wrecked. 
exhausted. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And it definitely affects how you would structure your normal day. Like when I was coaching in person, I would have to do like really pushing myself. I do three in a row before taking mm. a break. So I do like three, take a break, three, take a break, three, take a break. And I'd usually do like about 10, 11 sessions a day, like one on one, whatever. When I was in person, that was, you know, quite a while back. Um, so now all my clients are, are online, uh, but I do coach some of the athletes who train at the facility that, mm -hmm. that I, that I work out at. So I don't like do in-person sessions there, but we all train together, but I'm not their coach. I'm now their training partner, just like they're my training partner. So we work together. I'll spot for them. I'll load for them. I do, but I do that for everyone, mm -hmm. right? Because we're all trying to work together as a team and get each other better. So, um, I'd say my demographic that I work with is, um, I mean, it's mostly people who are performance based, mm -hmm. uh, mostly people who are, um, you know, either strength athletes or they're like, uh, you know, first responders or military. Um, most of my clients also have either like a, like a secondary goal of, uh, of enhancing their body composition, but I would say oftentimes it's probably secondary to performance. So I still do a lot of nutrition stuff like that with them. But in terms of their actual experience, I've got people who are like, I don't know, like international elite powerlifters, or like, you know, some super high level. And then I've got a couple like national level uh, strongman athletes. But then I've also got like literally just, you know, suburban dads who just love powerlifting like it's not their life but they love it and so they're like in their kind of 40s and 50s and they're getting quite a bit stronger so it's a pretty diverse sure. uh, mix of people male female things like that that is a cool thing about powerlifting is uh is, you know especially if you came up because if you played sports growing up you you know and you're and you're competitive it's like it's a major major part of your life for all through your youth you know you're always having events always having competitions and especially like if you play football uh, w when that ends, you know, there's no adult football league, you know, and so, it, you know, it, it's difficult. And then there's not much, you know, there, you know, like maybe or like a rec basketball league somewhere and there's softball, you know, but there's not there isn't much. And so, like, if you grew up around that, I think it's a more difficult thing to drop than people appreciate when when it first happens, you know, like uh, you think it's just like a small part of your life. But, you know, it's like when. You, all your life as far back as you can remember you were all there's always a competition there was always a team there's always a, a goal there's always this thing you're working really hard for with other people and then it's like you know graduate college you know if you, if you play college sports sports are over and then now just don't be competitive don't you know like you're supposed to just shut it off and go through life and now all that's gone and you it, it's not it, it's like that that's hard to just drop and so I think powerlifting is really cool in that regard is that you can, you know, you get your training partners and you kind of have this, like that the competitive juice is flowing again. And it's close to like a true state that you can really get as an adult. Cause you know, you play softball in a beer league, it, you know, it gets some of that level, but that's not, it's not the same as it's not a real competition. Like, like you did when you played baseball, you know? And so I think that's, that's something like from as far as a, like a mental aspect, it's just really good to have in your life. Yeah, it's it's funny actually. So I was chatting with uh, Joe Sullivan, who was on the podcast not too long ago, and we were talking about this exact thing about you know what it's like transitioning from being a powerlifter, like being competitive at a high level, to not being able to do anything. And it's honestly kind of like getting a divorce, you know. Hmm. Regardless of whether like the divorce is amicable or it's just a shit show, you know, which I guess would be the equivalent of having an injury that throws you out versus maybe decide hmm. to walk away from the sport it's still such a drastic change. You know, you're living with this person all this time and then all of a sudden there's no longer there. And yeah. so what do you do to fill that void? Because it's not just a void of time, it's a void of meaning and purpose and values potentially. So like purpose. you were saying, I think, I think switching to powerlifting or, or anything really ends up allowing you to take advantage of another vehicle to be able to express your values. You know, so for instance, I was asked once, like, what am I going to do once I hit my targets or whatever for powerlifting? And I was like, I'll, I'll stop. I'll leave. Like, really? Like, how, what, what are you talking about? And I was just like, look, like, these are the things that I value and I love powerlifting, but powerlifting is just a vehicle for me to express those values, mm -hmm. you know? And so once that's done, then I move on to another sport, but I'm still able to do all of those things that I get from powerlifting. 
Um, and so I think exactly like you were saying, people who came from a sporting background or, or some other competitive background, now they can just translate a lot of those things and get a lot of the same benefits from powerlifting or just, you know, sports in general, uh, like sport lifting, sorry, in general, because you also have that sense of community. A lot of the times you go to a private club, which is massive. And so now it's not just about you. It's also about helping your community get stronger, helping build other people up, being there for them. When they have a big squat day, you show up, you spot, you load. If someone's competing, everyone shows up and you start yelling at them and cheering for them. So it's like this really, it's a really cool little like niche, I guess. <laughs> Well, if anyone wonders how CrossFit happened, you know, like this, because it basically about 10 or 12 years ago just kind of exploded from nowhere. That's, that's it, you know, because that, like that, the one thing that community has in spades is the, is all of that, you know, and whether, you know, people will not cross, not CrossFit or, or not, or, you know, some will like it, some won't, but they, the people that do it definitely get all of that from it. It's, it's, uh, they, that whole, um, concept really nailed it with, with that in a way that the, that the standard gyms never did. Yeah, they, they really, really crushed it. Well, speaking of clientele, so if you look at, you know, if we take those three categories, like, you know, kind of general fitness guy, you know, person trying to get back into shape, then you have strongman, you know, power lifter. Can you kind of walk through like overview of how you first start working with someone and maybe some differences between those three groups? Yeah, so I guess how when I start working with an individual, the process is the same. So I follow like you know, a principled approach. And the only differences are essentially in how these, these things are going to be executed. But the first aspect would essentially be just doing a, a proper needs analysis. So really coming to understand the individual as a little bit more of a whole. So understanding them as an athlete, understanding their experience, you know, their, their performance, their level, what their goals are, uh, what their particular constraints are, but then also understanding them as an individual, right? So let's say there's a nutritional component what's your history of nutrition like do you have a history of disordered eating do you have a history of like you know chronic dieting or anything like that do you have any sort of health concerns that maybe i need to be aware of um, that are dietary related uh, do you have any sort of like psychological issues that could potentially interfere whether it's like an eating disorder or, or even like subclinical issues so really just establishing a really really good broad understanding of that individual and establish the correct starting point because once I have all that information, that is gonna help get me into the ballpark of the beginning or the onset of the intervention, whether it's training, nutrition, some combination of the two. So, um, you know, maybe I have a super high level lifter or maybe I have a super novice person. At the end of the day, that starting point is gonna be based on the information that I collect mm -hmm. and, and, their, and their ability to actually execute. So one thing that you mentioned initially, Justin, was, you know, are they going to be able to execute it? Like the perfect program doesn't matter if they can't actually execute. Mm -hmm. So I'm a really big fan of uh, the behavior change model uh, by, by BJ Fogg. He has really, really simplistic version, essentially, that looks at uh, behavior kind of within three different components, right? So we have the motivation component, then we have the ability or competence, and then we have like an action threshold. So for instance, you want to you want to essentially take things that are going to be fairly low in terms of motivation and ability. Now, that's a subjective determination because if I were to give you something and I say, okay, here's something that I know Justin can do. You're a very high level um, in, in terms of your ability to execute nutrition and training. You've been doing this a very, very long time. You've got a ton of experience. What you would consider easy is going to be light years ahead of what a novice would, right? But it still satisfies the principle of being something you can actually cross that action threshold because it's something that's within your capacity, right? And so we have to take in the broader context of talking about sleep, work, other competing priorities, if there's ambivalence there and, and all of that sort of stuff. But we essentially find something that, you know, ideally we pick the low hanging fruit first and then scale up from there. Um, and regardless of whether someone's like an international lead athlete or they're brand new to training and nutrition, they've never actually experienced anything, it's going to be the exact same process. We start you here and then we progress you to over here eventually. And I think that an iterative approach is really important. So, you know, we can't necessarily have an assumption around how long it's going to take an individual to adopt a particular set of skills. We just have to sort of track their progress and see, hey, are we creating the correct intervention? And their ability to execute is essentially going to determine that. 
Now, there are people out there who just genuinely don't give a fuck, but in my experience, they're actually pretty few and far between, right? I think if you have those conversations and I think that if you, you know, if someone's paying you, in the overwhelming majority of cases, they genuinely do want to change. They want some. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's just about connecting with that person and finding the appropriate path. And a lot of that is just has nothing to do with the research or any anything about like the science or whatever. It's just about communication. Like, hey, you know, here's where I think we should start based on where your deficits are at. I think this is going to, you know, be where we can make the most impact and simultaneously create the least amount of friction in your current lifestyle. Does that sound good? Do you think you can do this? Yeah, I can. Or no, I can't. Okay, well, let's let's see if we can adjust it. And then you just kind of have that back and forth until eventually you land on something that's going to work. Um, and that could be a conversation that's regarding, you know, the initial uh, intervention you apply for nutrition. That could be regarding the total training frequency. So if it's three days a week, four days a week, five days a week, whatever, that could be uh, what the progression strategy looks like. So maybe we're going to up their step count, or maybe we're just going to up the, uh, the the frequency of their lifting. Maybe we're going to adopt a nutrient timing strategy. Whatever we do, we want to make sure that they can they can crush it to about 80%. You know, if they can hit that 80%, that's a really productive threshold to work in. And it might not be perfect, but they're still seeing progress. And then they can work from that 80% to kind of build it up to, you know, let's say 90, 95, 100%. And then we start adding on something else as their ability to tolerate more things and juggle more, um, juggle more things. I can improve. Yeah, no, and I, and I know each elite athlete or each athlete is going to be different. Right. But I'm curious to, to understand a little more on, uh, on this elite lifter I'm experienced and, uh, I come to you, you know, what are some things that you do or are able to do, um, online through coaching to assess i mean are you looking at i'm just curious are you looking at movement patterns or videos of them moving uh things of that nature and what do you look for and then i guess the second follow-up to that is if you could get maybe an example of something you see and then how that how that applies in a in a you know program like in a phase or whatever it is sure so if we're talking about elite lifters um I, i'll be reviewing the the videos of everyone that i coach um mm-hmm. so They'll submit their videos and I, I have specific instructions around how I want them to submit it because I'm sure you've probably had this where you get someone submitting a video of a bench press or something like that. And then all you see is like this part of them. And you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. That. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, um, I'll look at their video. I always get the ones where uh, press play, turn the phone around, lean in against the dumbbell. Oh, yeah. Stand up. <laughs> I talk someone. <laughs> you can edit it after. Just show the bench. <laughs> then I'm scrolling, yeah, yeah. trying to find. When does this lift start? Yeah, you got to like fast forward, yeah. you know, three quarters of the way through for like a thirty second video. Yeah. Um, it's all that's yeah. the that's like the older men. The most like the younger kids, they have it all like precise and edited. There, you know, you want vertical? What ratio do you want? The old guys are like, my kid told me to press this button. I got you got a fourteen minute video for one set. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yes, I will do uh, video reviews and that's something that we work on a ton because if your technique is not a hundred percent, it can really stifle your ability to, I guess, tolerate higher workloads, right? Because you got to think there's going to be increased orthopedic stress. If you're not really creating rigidity, maybe your, you know, hip is shifting or maybe your knee is caving and, and that's not necessarily inherently problematic, but over time, if we keep doing that over and over and over, sometimes that's indicative of an actual energy deficiency or some sort of leakage where that energy could have been spent transferring it vertically into that squat. But now we're leaking through, you know, other force vectors or other vectors or whatever. And so looking at that, enhancing their bracing, enhancing their rigidity, um, getting them, you know, different tactile cues or other exercises to really enhance their ability to execute those movements is incredibly important. So that's something I go through on a weekly basis with them. Mm. Um, And that is very important. But also, it's just looking at the actual program and making, you know, weekly iterations. So all the programs that I do are on a weekly basis because the feedback loop is much quicker. Let's say I do a program for a month and someone tweaks their back for whatever reason. And I don't know for a month. Well, we just fucking wasted three weeks of training because they had to, they couldn't do deadlifts anymore for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So maybe I pull the deadlifts and instead we start doing trap bar deadlifts. Is it perfect? No, but we're still getting a very good stimulus on their quads, on their hips. You know, so, so there's a lot of different things like that that you can do. 
Um, in terms of uh, implementation, I'll also try and really force people to, to get higher outputs. That's probably one of the most important things is looking at people. Because if you prescribe, let's say, RPE 8, is it actually an 8? In my experience, most of the time it's not. It's like a 6 or a 5 or a 4 even. And as much as people want to say like high level athletes are good at judging their RIRs, they're not as good as people think, you know, mm. like these guys work hard, but over time you will just slide. Like everyone will slide down. It doesn't matter how hard you work. You need other eyes on you. And so that's one thing that I'll really look at and I'll be like, Hey, I want you to up this weight. I want like a lot of the times that I'm working with someone initially, I'll actually select a load for them. I'll say, I want you to go up to this weight instead. Like, no, I can't do that. I'm like, well, let's just do it and see what happens. Mm. Oh, lo and behold, that's an actual you RPE 8, you know? And so um, getting people to work at a high enough output is incredibly important. That's one thing that I always will review. So whenever they're submitting their videos, I'll also see what the actual prescription is. So it might be like, you know, three second pause, Spoto bench press at uh, two RIR or whatever. And then I'll see it and I'll be like, mm, I want you to add 20 pounds next time, you know? And I mean, over time, you just get sort of a feel of yeah. how close they are to failure. Um, and so you'll kind of know what loads to select. So I do a lot of that initially. As people get better, there's less of that. But then there will be periods where I'll still need to push them on a certain lift or they're sandbagging something. So that's a really big element as well that I'll usually implement. And then just those weekly changes uh, of, of volume allocation or intensity. Maybe this week I'm really pushing their deadlift. Uh, intensity up because it just seems to be going super, super well. So I just want to maximize what we can get out of it. And then the next week, maybe I'll pull it back so it can recover a little bit. So those weekly iterations are really important. And a lot of that stuff is happening through those weekly uh, check-ins that we do where I'm getting all this feedback on their mood, their perception of training, and, and all of these other variables that I might collect uh, to give me a better understanding, not just of their performance in the gym, because I can see their numbers, but that doesn't necessarily tell me what's going on. So when I see the numbers, but then I also have the feedback of how is training feeling? How are you enjoying it? All this stuff. Then I get a lot more about, okay, I think we can push a little bit harder, or maybe this is good. We can just kind of let this ride for the next couple of weeks. Uh, or maybe we need to pull back just a little bit, or maybe make some minor adjustments. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say it, it's two points I want to make is one is, you know, you have to be really really good like to be able to do that like i'll give you an example just uh, in a comparison uh justin for example he we were looking at photos of one of his athletes and he could tell he was a little watery versus being fat and i'm just like the level of detail because justin's been looking at pictures of bodybuilders for over 20 years and i'm sure for you like looking at the movement i've been like, looking at men for much longer than that <laughs> <laughs> uh this is a no judgment zone so it's all good man um yeah. But then for you to be like 20 pounds, you know, it's like, like there's no, there's no way to, you know, as you said, you know, using the terminology earlier, like engineer that. Right. So I think that's, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a talent in itself. And I think you're absolutely right about like having a coach because the other, the second thing I wanted to say was, I remember there's certain times, uh, what was it last year? No, was it about a year or two years? Whatever it was, it's about a year and a half. I competed, uh, Justin coached me. Um, last time I did it was in my early twenties with him. We used to compete together. And then I, I did another one like a year and a half ago after, you know, 17 years of not doing it. But I remember like certain times I was going to push harder and he would back off. Other times I was going to back off and he'd push harder. And I'm like, I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm like, I give up. I'm like, I have the worst perception, like degrees, list of certifications, 20 years in the Most field. People do on what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> I, that's what I find like, uh, most people, especially like the higher level people, that's really what you're doing is they like uh, the people who are high level and super motivated, they'll usually want to push harder when they probably shouldn't, you know, and, and it's it's like because they're you know, want to a lot of times that's what you're doing with them is just you're like this for bodybuilding anyways, it, you know, which is a little more emotion in, involved in the process with like the diet and the cardio and stuff. But yeah, a lot of what yeah. you're doing is just like not, not make not letting them destroy themselves, but really. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I'm the same way. So it's a bit of a catch 22 because I love programming for myself. You know, it's just, I like experimenting. I like going through it. It's a great learning process, but then, um, I hired a coach a couple years back 
and I worked with him for, well, I'm still working with him, but now he's just doing my nutrition. Um, and, uh, but at the time he was doing my nutrition and my training and the amount that I learned was just astonishing because there was nothing in particular that I could point to where I would say, I didn't know this, but it was how he kind of orchestrated the progression of everything yeah. over time. Like I got to see all of these different aspects of his, of his ability as a coach and how he handled different situations. And that was something I had never experienced before having never had a coach. And so when you see that, you're like, Oh shit, like this is the difference that a coach makes. And so someone asked me not too long ago about programs They're like, do you write programs? I was like, no, I don't write programs. In my opinion, it's a waste of time. Go get something for free on the internet, you know, because the value of a coach is their coaching, mm -hmm. not the numbers that they're writing on a, on a piece of paper. You know, that's part of it. But I would say that it's certainly not the majority of it in my mind. It's, it's more about how you're executing and those subtle adjustments, like you said, for damage control, where you're like, no, nah, you need to pull back a little bit or now you need to push a little harder. Like those things, I think, are the things that really, really make the difference, especially in the long run. Yeah. Well, I wanted to transition to, you have uh, a lot of great, uh, you know, content looking at on your Instagram. So a couple of things kind of popped up. You did some, you did some content on like cardio and strength training and if it's like an interference. And I think just for our audience out there, it'd be good to kind of hear your perspective about your thoughts on cardio relative to strength. And then when you have your athletes do cardio or don't do cardio and what type and so on. Yeah. So, um, I mean, like everything that's going to be context dependent. And so aerobic conditioning is really important just in general for, for strength athletes. So one, uh, I think the video you're referring to on, on Instagram, one of the things that I've said was power lifters will claim that they don't do cardio because it inhibits their strength gains. But really that's just an argument of convenience. The reality mm -hmm. is most of them are just lazy. Yeah. And so it and most cases, a convenient probably thing. Most cases, if, if they did it, implemented it properly, it would improve their strength. A hundred percent, right? And so this is especially relevant for the super heavyweights, the, the really heavy dudes who just have mm -hmm. terrible conditioning, right? Like, you know, we can look at something that's very simple. Like uh, Mike Isertel came up with, you know, the, the volume landmark. So if we look at minimum effective dose and maximum recoverable volume, and we just say, okay, we can understand conceptually that there's a minimum requirement that you need to hit in terms of your workload to promote a productive adaptive response to your training. Well, what happens if your recovery is just dog shit and you can't actually meet that? Well, your performance is going to be impaired, right? Now we're talking in extremes, but we can understand how nutrition is going to affect that. We can understand how your sleep is going to affect that. But a lot of the times people don't recognize how your aerobic conditioning actually plays into that. Well, aerobic conditioning does a couple of things. One, it improves uh, your, your stroke volume. It improves uh, capillarization. So, you know, it enhances your, your the amount of oxygen and nutrient transport. It also helps with clearing of metabolic byproducts, right? So things like the hydrogen ion, which is going to help fatigue you, or sorry, which is going to fatigue you. So now we're improving your set to set recovery. We're increasing your time to exhaustion. So you can actually have more output per set. We're increasing your ability to recover between sessions as well as within a session. We're increasing your work capacity acutely and chronically, and we're basically improving your ability to adapt to the imposed demands. So all of a sudden, you could only, let's say, train up to here. So let's say this is the minimum effective dose, and then this is your maximum adaptive threshold, where this is where you need to be, but you're only here because you're mm -hmm. still making progress. Everything's still going well, but if we were to improve aerobic conditioning to this point, maybe you get 5% more results. Now, 5% might not sound like a lot, but over the span of 10 years, it's fucking huge. Yeah. So, and, and in my opinion, it actually might be a fair bit more than 5%, right? But again, these are just kind of like speculative terms. Um, you're going to see better results because you're going to recover better. You're going to be able to have it a higher output. And I mean, how many power lifters, you know, put all their energy into their top sets. And then by the time they get to any of their accessories, they're just dragging ass because they're just right. exhausted, Right. So it's like, okay, now you're just doing junk volume. You're not really getting anything out of those Bulgarian split squats because you're only doing them with 70 pounds. I've got a girl who weighs 120 pounds who does 70 pound Bulgarian dump, uh, dumbbells for Bulgarian split squats. 
So it's like, you're going to tell me that you're 120 kilos and you're only using 70s? Like, come on, bro. You need to be using like 150s at least. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like, now you're just adding fatigue with no additional benefit. So I think that that can really, really play an important role in improving people's performance as well as their recovery. How you might implement that, there's a variety of different ways. And I think the implementation is also really important because, again, maybe someone likes running. And that might be fantastic if you're a really small girl or a really small male athlete as well. But if you're, again, a 125 kilo lifter and you've never run before and all of a sudden you decide to go for, you know, a one kilometer run, one kilometer is not that far. But it sure as shit is if you're a massive dude who's going to beat the crap out of his knees, hips, back and ankles and Achilles tendon. You know, so you have to be considerate about like the actual loading and the stress and the type of stress you're imposing as well. So same thing with a rower. Maybe a rower is great for a smaller athlete, but for a big dude who gets crazy low back pumps, you probably don't want to do it. Um, I'm a really big fan of just utilizing rest periods in, in training. So I tend to prescribe rest periods for almost everything, including in season, off season, uh, for the most part. Because I think that if you do that, you can really start to build up your, your specific and non-specific work capacity. So for instance, myself, uh, when I'm doing uh, deadlifts or squats or whatever, I only take 180 seconds rest, right? So that's only three minutes. If I'm working up to a top set, that's not that much. And then on a lot of my back off works, I'll only do 120 seconds rest. If I'm supersetting, so the other day I was supersetting leg press and, uh, and hamstring curls, and I'm pushing those pretty darn hard, and I'm only taking 90 seconds rest. Right. So that in and of itself, like you're going to be sweating, you're going to be breathing heavy, your workouts are going to be super efficient and it's going to suck for about a week or two. But then after two weeks, you're going to get it and then you're just going to be in great shape. Right. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to do it just by adopting, you know, different rest periods and increasing your work density. I think there's uh, step count is one of my favorites because it's just such low hanging fruit and it's not only beneficial from an aerobic standpoint, but also just psychologically just to get out, be in nature. There's so much data on the benefits of being exposed to nature uh, on your, on your mood, your mental health, all that stuff. So we get so many additional benefits outside of just improving your aerobic base. Um, then you can look at cycling. You can look at uh, ellipticals. I personally tend to bias things that are maybe low impact with low eccentric stress because you know, you're a power lifter, you want to prioritize your strength. You don't necessarily want to have right. additional stuff, but I love hiking. So I go for trail hikes all the time, but I don't do crazy elevations. I try and kind of do something a little bit more like that. And I do it on the weekend after I've done my leg session. So it's not going to beat me up for a session the next day. Right. So there's a lot of different ways you can structure it. Um, but that's kind of a general outline. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. It uh, one other thing you brought up too, so I, thanks for that. I covered a lot of bases there. I think it's gonna be really good for our audience to kind of wrap their arms around uh, the benefits of that I know it's something Justin's talked about quite a bit, so it definitely reinforces uh, all of the above. Um, you were, I, I've seen some of your content talking about queuing, um, you know, in different ways to describe queuing and how different people hear different things. Can you walk through maybe some of the basic cues when you look at like a bench squat and deadlift that? You know, if you if you had to pick one that's maybe misunderstood, or how you kind of help your client understand some a cueing on a, on one maybe one for each movement, and I'm going to ask for one for each movement selfishly because I would love to take it away when I go train this weekend. So sure, uh, you just mean general cues that I think are misunderstood? Yeah, um, I think hips back in the squat is really misunderstood. Uh, so a lot of the times, hips back, you know people will try and load their hips back way too much. And then you see them, they push their hips back. And then as they squat down, they kind of scoop forward. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you only need to load your hips back just far enough to be in that good position where you can just go straight down and straight up, right? There shouldn't be a huge change in your torso angle during the lift. It should be initial and then just straight down and up. Um, another thing that people struggle with is, is like arching their back uh, versus loading their hips. And that's, that's actually a very difficult thing to keep. <laughs> um, so, I mean, one of the things that I'll usually do is I'll usually try and do one of two things. Either I'll use something called uh, the method of amplification of error, MAE. So method of amplification of error was something I saw a study on a long time ago that they used in Olympic weightlifters, which was essentially if you do, let's say, a technical fault, you want to actually cue directly into that technical fault 
to exaggerate it because if you're doing a clear snatch and you're looping it out in front of you, right? Just tell them, okay, I want you to loop it way more. And then the moment they do that, they're like, oh my God, this hurts my shoulders. It feels terrible, right? So they can kind of know like, oh, I understand what you mean. It's like, okay, cool. Now tighten it up. And so that actually kind of retrains your nervous system mm. to some degree. Kind of like when you're a child and you're learning to walk, you learn to walk by learning by falling, which, which teaches you what not to do essentially. So it's kind of a similar approach. Um, so I'll use method of amplification of error. So if they're doing the whole arching back or if they're pushing their hips way back, uh, back too far, I'll say, do more of that. Arch your back harder, do this. And that way they're like, oh my God, that feels awful. It's like, yeah, does it feel like your back's gonna break? Good, so stop doing that. Now what I want you to do instead is this, right? I want you to like pull in or like crunch or I might give them a little cue like that. So I found that that can be pretty helpful because sometimes they don't know the difference, like they can't feel that they're arching. So if we exaggerate it, that can be pretty helpful for getting them to first understand what they're actually doing. Um, the next thing that I like to do is sometimes using very slow tempos, just to give them a little bit more time to feel the movement while still under load. So they're still getting a very high relative effort, but they're not necessarily getting the heavy load that makes it very difficult to change their technique because they're just trying to survive kind of. <laughs> Um, I don't know if those are necessarily cues. I hope they are, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, <clears throat> that helps a lot. Cause I think that's something I definitely have done. Like, cause my hips are tight. So if I don't loosen them up enough, I'll try to overcompensate by pushing, pushing them back further. And then my lower back is like swollen, <laughs> yeah. just like, just completely j crammed with blood. So, uh, so for bench, one of the big ones is when people are coming down right at the bottom, they'll usually like relax and try and launch the bar back up. That's where most people lack stability. So one of the things that I really tell people to focus on is reaching your chest or reaching your sternum up to the ceiling. So as they come down, reach the sternum up and imagine your, your chest is like an eggshell. You don't want to hit it hard. You just want to barely touch it and then press back up. That really forces you to stay tight, kind of like a spoto press, right? Someone's all over the place. You get them doing a spoto with like a three second pause. All of a sudden, all that shit tightens way up. So I found that that's a really good cue, sternum up and the whole eggshell thing. And then um, same thing with the deadlift. So deadlift one is, uh, I'll tell them to like push the slack out of the bar instead of saying pull, because people will kind of pull, but they don't really create that global tension. And that was something I really struggled with for a long time until eventually I heard someone say, push the slack out. And I was like, oh, I get it. So it's like you grab onto the bar, you're pushing your feet into the floor, not enough to like lift, but you're really pushing hard. And so you feel tension through your whole body, but that creates the tension that you can now use to, to wedge your body in position. So once you're pushing, now it's like, okay, I'm gonna, if, if I'm pulling conventional, I'm gonna take a big breath in, breathe really, uh, really deep into my belly, expand out laterally, posteriorly to the front, and then I'm gonna lock my lats in. I'm still pulling, pushing the whole time, feet into the ground, and then you wedge your feet in and you kind of get your hips and everything into position while you're pushing through the ground the entire time. So now you've built up this whole tension, you've, you've filled up that trunk, and now you've locked everything and it compressed all that air. So now you have this really pressurized system and you're in a great position to go up. And so you're not going to have the hips kind of pop up and do all that stuff. So that would be my main one for, for deadlift is, is learning to push uh, the slack out of the bar. In, in that no, I think the way you describe it is really helpful too, because obviously we're not in a gym setting. So I think, you know, our, our uh, audience is going to be able to, you know, take that and really understand exactly what you said there. So thanks for walking through that because those are, those are helpful cues for sure. So. All right, now it's time for shoot, move, communicate. So we'll uh, rapid fire. Here we go. Uh, all right, first one. What accomplishments in your own com uh, competing are you most proud of? Uh, you would think I would say the winning nationals, but it actually wasn't. My most proud accomplishment was actually um, just helping some of my athletes like break national records and, and uh break a world record and stuff like that. That's for me been, been the most satisfying thing. Okay. Out fun, uh, outside of competitive lifting, uh, what is an accomplishment you're most proud of? Competitive lifting. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I try not to think about that stuff too much. Um, I don't know. I think stuff like this, like just being invited on podcasts, speaking at conferences, I feel like that stuff's pretty cool. Yeah, right. for sure. Cool. All right. One word to describe your overall, like a, your strength program, your approach to what would it be? Uh, collaborative and communicative. Okay. 
Sorry. It's all right. Uh, we won't mark you down. Uh, one word to encourage a young up and coming strength coach. What would it be? Mentorship. Good deal. And another one, uh, your describe your ideal athlete. What would that, what would they look like? What would they, how would you describe your ideal athlete? Uh, still one word. No, you can elaborate a little more. We'll get, we'll give you a little pass on that one. Mm -hmm. I have my word. My name has two words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think the biggest thing that I look for is just someone who is like really passionate, you know, because like, I don't know, like there's people who, who are disciplined. There's people who all, but if you're really passionate about something, you'll learn the discipline. You'll, you'll get the skills. You'll do all that stuff and you'll stick with it. And you'll, you know, but someone who just like, is like maybe passion. So the right word persistent. Mm -hmm. So really persistent, they will find a way. And if you hook someone up who's persistent with someone who knows what they're doing, they're going to go very far. All right. Good deal. Justin, do you want to share your two words? It's Justin <laughs> Harris. <laughs> no, I actually like that. I think, yeah, like it, it, you can't, you can teach hard work a little bit, but not really. And some people just have it in them or they don't. And it's amazing yeah. how far that'll carry you. You know, I, a, a decent amount of athleticism with a shitload of hard work is going to be a shitload of athleticism with no hard work. You know, you see it all the time. And when things come too easy to people, you know, they, a lot of times they don't have the hard work that comes with it. Now, when you get someone who's got, you know, the genetics and athleticism and the work ethic, that's pretty tough to beat, but that's, that's a real unicorn. Yeah. That's like a John hack. All right. Next one. If you had to miss one, what would it be? A meal, a night of sleep or a training session? meal easy <laughs> all right let's see here next one is uh what is a current uh we talk about here at first attachment being all in and so the question is what is something you're currently just all in on? what would that be like a passion project or something you're all in about um especially lately actually it's been like outreach work uh, that's something that's pretty important to me. okay cool. good deal we also talk about how our products at First Attachment are battle tested. So the question would be, can you share with the audience uh, maybe an obstacle, something that makes you battle tested, something you're able to work through? Battle tested. Uh, I think just generally having like adversity, especially when you're growing up, that's that that kind of makes you a little different. Like uh, Justin was saying, and I totally agree. Like I don't necessarily think you can teach that hard work stuff. Like I think you meet people who just kind of came from poverty or came from bad countries that it just makes you gritty, you know, mm -hmm. and sure. all of a sudden you give them the opportunity, you give them the environment and they just freaking bulldoze everything in their way. So I, I would probably say like some, some early adversity was uh, something that worked in my favor. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. Well, thanks again for uh, joining us today on the first attachment podcast. We appreciate that. And Daniel DeBrock, where can they find you at? Where are some places people can look up your content? Uh, so I'm most active on Instagram, but, uh, and that's Daniel underscore DeBrock. All my stuff is Daniel underscore DeBrock. So it's YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and my podcast is a stack strength podcast. Uh, but I'm currently pushing out a lot more content on YouTube. So it's going to be more long form stuff as well. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on. Like you guys are, are pretty awesome. Justin, I've been following your work for a very, very long time. And so it's pretty thank cool you. to be a guest on your podcast and I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Good stuff. Well, thanks so much everybody for tuning in. As always, remember to like, subscribe, turn on notifications and comment. Thanks again for joining us. Have a good night. We'll see you.